There's a school of thought amongst top grandmasters that you should study pawn structures because you can uh, understand plans and tactics that arise from the pawn structures. Today we're going to look at isolated queen pawn, but just let me put a structure in front of you so that may be very identifiable. Identifiable, the French defense pawn structure um, with this pawn on e5. So by, by studying games that just feature this structure, you start to get a feel for the plans and ideas. Well, white might, for example, be playing for f4, f5. Uh, white might, for example, be playing for bishop d3, takes h7. Black, for his part, is looking to break down the structure in the center with moves like c5, knight c6, and f6, and so on. So a lot of grandmasters like just studying um, um, middle games from the perspective of the pawn skeleton or the pawn structure. The pawn structure we're going to be looking at today can come from a wide range of openings, a, a terrash. Uh, isolated queen pawn that might, for example, come about like this. In this isolated queen pawn, the isolated queen pawn, of course, is the black pawn on d5, and white has fianchettoed his bishop. Another isolated uh, queen pawn position might occur from, for example, this, 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 and in this case, black, white's bishop is not fianchettoed, it stands on the e2 square. But again, the isolated queen pawn, and the isolated queen pawn comes from many, many openings. Uh, Karo Khan, you will see an isolated queen pawn like this. This particular line of the Karo Khan, by the way, is rather interesting because in the isolated queen pawn, black can go for e6 and bishop e7, for example, like this. And presto, we have an isolated queen pawn position. Or black might fianchot his bishop like in the Rubinstein uh, Tarash, like this. And again, the isolated queen pawn in the center of the board. Um, the following game was a very, very important game in Grandmaster Larry Christensen's career. He was playing against a very experienced Grandmaster from Romania, Florin Gheorghiu. Larry Christensen is one of those few players in the world that never became an international master. He literally skipped the class. He went from master to Grandmaster. I went through the international master title. I was very, very happy to receive it. The vast majority of grandmasters do. Larry was unique. And uh, in this game, it was absolutely crucial to his becoming a grandmaster that he win this game. We have our isolated queen pawn position. In those days, bishop e7 was a very, very fashionable move, obviously. Uh, today, I want to say that actually bishop b4 has become a little bit more fashionable, putting pressure, sorry, I want to say bishop b4, <laughs> didn't want that to happen, but okay, uh, putting pressure on the uh, c3 uh, pawn. Oftentimes, white uh, is compelled to play a move like bishop d2, and there are reasons why black players like that, but again, at the time, bishop e7. And the players quickly reach what I want to say is a modern tabia position. Let's break it down for a second. What are the pros and cons of the isolated uh, queen pawn position? When you look at the pawn on d4, it's isolated in the sense there's no pawn on e3 or c3 to support the pawn. It stands alone. It requires the defense of pieces. You can't rely upon a pawn. 
the pawn on d4 faces off against the pawn on e6. The pawn on e6 isn't isolated at all, but the pawn on d4 gives white a measure of space, uh, an advantage most typically found utilizing the e5 square. Um, by knight e5. Also, white, with his last move, just plays the move rook e1, bringing his rook on the half-open file. While it's true the rooks also belong on the open c-file, from white's point of view, when you're playing the isolated queen pawn position, you're trying to avoid the trade of pieces and rooks. The more pieces you keep on the board, the better for the player with the isolated queen pawn. Conversely, if you're black, such as in this game, facing against the isolated queen pawn, tr peace trades are to be welcomed. Um, white oftentimes does not want to put a rook on the c-file because uh, it often happens in those cases that rooks simply get traded off the board. Knight f6. All right, again, this is one of the main moves in this position. Other main moves include uh, bishop f6, simply attacking uh, the pawn at once. Oftentimes, white plays the move bishop d4 as a response to bishop f6, protecting the pawn. And the other move is queen b6, another main move, move very, very topical as black looks to position his rook on d8. So black's idea is to put pressure on this pawn on d4 so that white's attacking pieces. Uh, black would love, for example, for white to play moves like bishop e3 and knight e2, defending the pawn and getting wrapped up in the defense of the pawn as opposed to using the extra space to attack black's king. Knight f6, okay, eyeballing the pawn on d4. I talked about in one of the master classes how good it is to have a knight on the f3 and f6 squares, that it's very, very hard for the attacker to succeed when the knights are on f3 and f6. Wow, sorry, I'm in a, in a, a noisy... Uh, situation upstairs. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's just been such a busy period around here. Everybody's doing something. And uh, today, um, Aman and um, Eric got their visas, three-year visa to China. Not bad. They can go in and out of China over the next three years. A2, A3. What's the idea? As clear as a bell. You want to stop the move knight before, and you'll see why in a moment that is important. b6. So black's problem is his bishop on c8. It's looking for a better view than just eyeballing behind the um, pawn on e6. In the old days, they used to like this line with queen b6 that I showed earlier. Sorry. Just let me put that move on the board. In the old days, they like, used to like this kind of situation where they oftentimes, let me just put some moves on the board. Um, let's try a rookie too. Uh, I'm just trying to get a particular type of position. The old guys, the classical players, like to put their bishop on e8, which was a very interesting way of just shoring up uh, the king side. This game took an absolutely different turn, of course. Uh, b7, b6, uh, Fee and shadowing the bishop on the long diagonal, not putting it on the passive square e8. If you're going to go for uh, the defense with the bishop on e8, don't entomb the rook on f8. Make sure that that rook gets out first. Bishop c2. Now we can see what the move a3 was all about. 
as white prepares to put his queen on the b1 diagonal. Now here, Flo uh, Georgiou makes, in my opinion, a slightly dubious move. He plays by root, by rote. Uh, bishop b7, this fine move, nothing's wrong with that move, but it doesn't interfere with white's plan. After bishop b7, we see the move queen d3, and now we understand that white is lining up, and he's trying to induce black to push his kingside structure forwards and create weaknesses around his king. Black could have actually kind of tried to cross up white's plans with the move bishop a6. Taking the square d3 under control, preparing to play the move rook c8. In my opinion, the move bishop a6 was better. If white tries to play a move, for example, like b4, to drive the bishop back, first of all, you can go back, and it's not bad from black's point of view that he induced the move b4. The knight on c3 is weakened. But also, the move bishop c4 is quite okay. Black wants to blockade uh, the d5 square. The weakness of the isolated queen pawn is that you don't have a pawn on a c4 or a pawn on e2 uh, to control the square in front of the pawn. So bishop b7, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that move. I just think that bishop a6 is a better choice by black. Queen d3. And now we can see that uh, white is the first to create uh, a threat. We would say that white has an initiative, initiative being the ability to create threats. And now, um, black played the very, um, I want to say, compliant g7, g6, uh, shutting down the diagonal, but allowing the move bishop h6. I would like to ask yourselves a question. I'll put you to the test, so to speak. Why not wait for the move bishop g5 before playing g6? In other words, black played g6, white played bishop h6, and the game continued. And white got the opportunity to play bishop c1, to h6, developing with gain of time um, as well. Why didn't black play the move rook c8? For example, waiting for the move bishop g5, g6, bishop h6, and then you get the same position with the rook on c8. So, question for the class. Take your time. There's a hidden tactic. Why not rook c8? Why not rook c8? Always play bishop f8. Hey, yes, I just want to deliver the message that it's heating up between Naka and Daniel. Naka said he lost all respect for Daniel after he tried to flag him on a fully drawish game, and Daniel said he won't deal with the irrationality of Naka. Hoo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> that sounds like uh, two young bucks clashing. There's some funny business with D5, says Lusflovira. F6 knight could be attacked otherwise. Knight g5, d5, knight e4, d5. Okay, the nose knows all. Can you play knight e4? First of all, knight e4 is perfectly legal. There's nothing wrong with it. But one of the major tenets of the isolated queen pawn is that white, in this case he's playing with the isolated queen pawn, is not eager to trade pieces. So this trade of knights should benefit black. We can see already 
that suddenly it might be black with uh, the chance of making the initiative, of seizing the initiative. Knight e4 is not correct. I have seen the proper move in the channel, so I congratulate those who found it. The proper move is d5. And let's see, we cannot play knight takes d5. Oopsie daisy, that's a mate and one. Clear, but what about pawn takes? Well, now we notice that the rook, remember the rook uh, kind of slid over there in a very nice way a moment ago, just for such a, uh, an ambush-like tactic. Uh, after e takes d5, the, the um, file has been opened, and now bishop g5 threatens bishop takes f6 and checkmate. If the diagonal is blocked, then you have this very powerful sacrifice. Rook takes e7, queen takes e7, knight takes d5, and in this position, white has one material and has, in my opinion, a winning position. So that's a very, very typical tactic, and one you absolutely must know when you're playing with the isolated queen pawn, or for that matter, against the isolated queen pawn, you must always be aware of these types of tactical situations. If a moment ago black had played knight e4, then after trades, you're threatening mate as well as this, and after, for example, f5, there's a check, and you are <coughs> uh, winning material by force. So that was why uh, Florin played the move g6 and not rook c8. Bishop h6, rook e8, rook b1. Again, you know, we say the rooks, uh, you know, belong on open files, and they do. This is an exception. Black, white, pardon me, is not interested in challenging control over the c file, but wants to keep his pieces on the board. The move rook d1 um, develops a piece, and as well, uh, white is looking for an opportunity of playing the move d5. Rook c8, developing. Another very, very standard mode of development for black here is to play the move queen d6. What the idea is, first of all, is to be able to bring the rook to d8. Again, to kind of menace uh, the pawn on d4. Sometimes with the queen on d6, you want to play bishop f8, but you don't want to be in the pin after bishop g5. So you get your queen out of the way first. So for example, if I play a move like h3, we could get into a situation where black comfortably reroutes his bishop to the g7 square, kind of covering the dark squares in his position. Again, we could trade these pieces, but it's one of those things where, again, black is looking to trade minor pieces. White should not. And queen d6 is a perfectly legitimate uh, setup. Rook c8 was played. Now, let me see. I'm about to ask the class what they want to do. Just a second. Bishop b3 is interesting. This diagonal has been completely, completely shut down. And so the bishop is looking uh, to create... Uh, threats and it patrols different diagonals. Uh, another diagonal that the bishop could conceivably um, control is the um, a4 diagonal. With the move bishop b3, white is looking at potential sacrifices. Knight g5, it's a lot of arrows. Let me, let me see if I can know. Uh, it's a lot of arrows, but there are sacrificial ideas that Knight g5 and knight takes f7 with the bishop on b3. Why not h4, h5? Okay, fair enough. Uh, h4 
the idea behind the move h4 is you want to use the pawn as a battering ram. For the moment, there is no h5. So um, black can maybe use this moment to um, do something. What would uh, I really want to do if I was black? I might want to play knight here with the idea of knight c4 and knight takes b2. Again, I can't play h5 right away. h4 is often seen in a lot of isolated queen pawn positions. Just don't think it's the right moment for it. Let's try it again. h4, knight c5, knight e5. Again, I want to just trade pieces. Let me just go here so I can trade the knights and try to force the trade of queens. Not so easy. Not so easy. All right, let's see if the queen... Too many arrows. Too many arrows. I agree. Uh, bishop b3. Oops, excuse me. Rook c8, bishop b3 was Larry's decision. Knight a5, bishop a2. Again, this bishop is, is eyeballing the e6 pawn, as is the rook. And pretty soon we can imagine this knight wants to go, like a bad move would be, for example, a6. And another bad move would be b5. Trying to bring the knight to c4, shutting down the bishop. Well, this is a very standard tactic that uh, you should be aware of in isolated queen pawns. You sacrifice on f7. Uh, sometimes it's not even necessary to, to um, have the bishop on, on a2. The bishop could be on b1 square, and you could sacrifice against the e6 pawn as well. So bishop a2 and Georgi played knight d5, blockading the pawn, which is very, very nice, of course, uh, to have a firm blockade. And once again, black is the one seeking trades, and the white player is the one who is trying to avoid trades. Okay. Knight e4. It's very, very important. I can't emphasize this enough. White should be trying to do his best to keep as many pieces on the board as possible. So the move knight e4. Now here, Yoryu played the move rook c7, and what he's anticipating is that this rook will patrol the seventh rank. Sometimes black plays f6, sometimes black plays f5. But by putting his rook on c7, he's ready to defend uh, laterally. And sometimes it's even useful to play moves like queen a8 or even queen c8 so you can drop a knight in on c4. Knight e4. Knight e5. Uh, you can see how Larry's pieces are taking up important central outposts. I wanted to say that after knight e4, uh, black has a very, very important um, and cynical uh, move, I should say. And that one is knight f6. Simply asking white, do you want to make a draw or... Would you like to play for a win like this with knight? You could play knight g3, but the knight is not particularly well placed on the g3 square. For example, you might regret the fact that your knight isn't on uh, c3, preventing a move like bishop d5. So imagine the move knight um, g5. And now bishop d5. What I would like to ask you is to calculate as best you can the consequences of the move knight takes f7. And after you've calculated what you think 
are the best moves and counter moves of knight takes f7. I'd like you to make a judgment for yourself. Uh, would you, the question is, would you make the sacrifice? Give yourself a few minutes. And as you're um, calculating those variations, I want to say thank you to Shakespeare for resubscribing for four months in a row. Thank you. Your support is most appreciated. Did Daigler uh, for the 100 bits? Yes, sir. Where are you headed after Can Calgary? I'm heading home to Holland tomorrow at the end of the month. I'm going to be in Oslo with Sapiko and Danny Wrench for the um, Fisher 960. Lost Copycat has subscribed using his Prime. Thank you for the support. Yamoto Cannon has resubscribed Tier 1 for two months in a row. Yay. What game is he looking at? I am looking at the game between Larry Christensen and Fleur, Florin Georgiou. Florin Georgiou was for many years, I'm going to even say decades, Romania's top grandmaster uh, during the time of the Iron Curtain. And Larry Christensen became a grandmaster uh, uh, by winning this game and Skipping the <clears throat> skipping the I international master title, um, <clears throat> it was played many years ago, but this particular game has become a kind of iconic game for isolated queen pawn players. Uh, thank you, Yamoto. Lord Barre has resubscribed to, to, for eight months. Tier 1, thank you very much for enjoying this content. Hope there will be loads more. Well, there it will be two more at the very least. This is kind of the uh, 4,800 level. We got 4,800 subscribers, and I said I would do master classes for each 100 that we uh, sub subsequently got to. We got to 4,900, and then we hit the big, big, big target of 5,000. So uh, I've got two more um, master classes to deliver after this one, Lord Barra. Thank you. Goal even has resubscribed for, for 19 months. Thank you very much. And Wapala has resubscribed for two months. Push him, baby. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Push him. Now, I hope you've managed to do some calculations regarding the sacrifice knight takes f7. And you've come to some judgments about that. Let's see what you have done. Knight king f7, knight g8, king g8, knight e6, bishop e6, bishop e6. Okay, very good. Um, I don't think black should play bishop takes e6, cap red, knight f7, king f7, knight g5, king g8, knight e6 seems good. But black doesn't have to take the knight. That's the point. Knows, knows all. He can just move the queen somewhere, defending the bishop on d5, like queen d7. And white still has to deal with the hanging bishop on a2. Correct. That's absolutely right. So knight g5, knight f7, king f7, knight g5, king g8, knight e6, queen d7, we might say is actually pretty good for black. However, young black has suggested knight f7, King f7, knight e5, check. Bravo. Not knight g5, check. But knight e5, check. King g8, knight takes g6. Bam. Now, uh, young black, you just said uh, h takes g6. That's a terrible move because queen takes g6, king h8, queen g7 is check and mate. But imagine knight f7, king f7, knight e5, check. King g8, knight takes g6, bishop takes a2. What do you think of them apples? Uh -huh. What's wrong with playing a bit safer with knight e5? Well, bishop takes a2. There you go. Knight e5, bishop takes a2. So what we're looking at 
is knight. I'm going to make this move. I'm going to make this move. I'm going to suggest that knight e5 check and knight takes queen d7. You come up empty. You've sacrificed a knight for two pawns. But at the end of the day, you're really not happy. This guy is hanging. And if you trade, for example, trade, don't see anything particularly wrong with black's position. So you have to come up with another way of justifying the sacrifice, and that's here. Now, I'd like you to think about this position and do your best in terms of calculating this position. You've got two pawns. Your bishop is hanging. You can't, black cannot capture this knight because the queen would come down and then it would be checkmate on g7. So tell me if you like this sacrifice for, for white or not. Hmm. Honolulu says, yes, it's good. Good for who? Good for white? Is it good for black? Good for who? For white. Okay. Analyze it a little bit deeper. Bishop takes a2. <laughs> Bishop takes a2. Knight takes e7. Queen takes e7. Queen g3 check. King h8. Two pieces up. Just Bishop a2 here, and the rook swingers don't do anything. I think black is fine. Just Fine. Zardine has a different idea. How about bishop takes a2, queen g3? Aha! Queen g3. Nice, Akian. Uh, then, white is threatening checkmates along the g3 file. Absolutely right. So, Knight takes g6, bishop takes a2, queen g3 is winning for white. You can't take. We've seen the same checkmate a moment ago. It hasn't uh, changed one little bit. And if you play, for example, bishop e7, there's a double check and a mate. And that's winning for white. So it turns out that after knight takes g6, you can't play bishop takes a2. It's a second. I, let me go back for a moment. I've done it wrong. Hold on. Oops, just a second. Let me just do this. Yes. This is what I wanted to say. The move queen g3 is so powerful that black has to play the move bishop d6 covering the g3 square. Then after knight e5, in order to again deliver the checkmate, we have queen c7 defending. Now in this position, you've got two pawns and an attack, um, but it's, I'm going to say, it's kind of like three results. It's not clear at all. This is a very, very typically chaotic line that very often comes in isolated queen pawn positions. The one thing that I really encourage you to realize, however, is that when you're playing on the white side, Learn to embrace those chaotic positions. 
uh, you're not going to win end games with the isolated queen pawn. What you're going to do is you're going to win middle games and you're going to win them through direct attacks. So a move like knight f6, this very, very provocative uh, line of play is a line of play that I want to say learn to embrace. These positions uh, will occur in your practice. Okay. Now, let's go back. Let's go back. Knight e4 was played. Rook c7 was played by Florin. And again, Black is thinking that his rook uh, will help protect the f7 square. He's thinking that he'll be able to play queen c8 and knight c4, cutting off this bishop. And Larry immediately played the move knight e5, settling his knight into the middle of the board, protecting the c4 square, by the way, but eyeballing very critically the f7 pawn. Bishop f8. Again, welcoming uh, sacrifice, uh, welcoming trades, I want to say, and protecting the f7 pawn. Uh, continuing with his policy of no trades, bishop g5. Now, here, of course, you can't play f6. That would be a, a huge, huge error. After bishop takes, there is the threat of knight takes, and you would be forced to really... Uh, damage your king side with takes on g5. Just not a very good idea whatsoever. Bishop e7. Bishop takes e7. And now we have, um, in my opinion, uh, uh, I'm not going to say a bad move. I just didn't like this move. Rook takes e7. Bishop takes d5. Pawn takes d5, and now we see why I didn't like the move rook takes e7. As the, the um, knight gets to the f6 square, king g7. And your turn. What did Larry Christensen play uh, with the white pieces now? T R T R X F T Y F T W. Pardon me. Why is chess so hard? It is. <laughs> it just is hard. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, chess is hard. I need a move. I need a move for white here. Help me out, folks. Help me out. Black has just played the move king g7. He wants to boot the knight away and just capture the knight, actually, if uh, we're not careful. So what did white play? Knight h5 check. Okay. Knight h5 check. He takes the knight. Knight on f6 to g4 with plans of queen h3, h6. I like it. I like it. That's a good plan. Knight g4. Is there other good moves? Other good moves besides um, not looking for knight g4 or knight h5. Looking for another good move. Hmm. How dangerous is that king takes f6 move. Hmm. Hmm. Ah, queen f3, queen h3. I'm attracted to queen h3, but am I happy to lose the knight? As pawn of Jehulu. Jehulu. Queen f3. Please put the coordinates on. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. I do attempt. Oh, boy. Where are the coordinates? Where are AB1 through 8? Uh, 
Amman. Sorry, the coordinates? Yeah. Like yeah, the, 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 the chessboard coordinates. Because yep. we've got uh, some, yeah, the settings. There it is. Inside, outside. There we go. They're just inside the border. Inside the border there. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Uh, the coordinates. So how dangerous is king takes f6? I've seen, a, I've seen it often enough, and I'm happy for I am Bricktop. Your vote put me over the wire. Queen h3, double exclam. A, a truly brilliant brilliant move as you look to capture the pawn with check driving the king up the board what would you do after king takes f6 a question for our audience what are you doing aren't you just blundering a knight <laughs> okay Knight g4, king h6, knight f6. The combo killer. Absolutely salty clown. I mean, if I could give you a, a prize, I would. Indeed. Knight g4 check, king g7, queen h6, king h8, knight f6. Um, you might remember the very first lesson about space. And my discussion of prime squares for the knights. Time and time and time again, you'll see with those attacks how powerful a knight is on f6. So this kind of dovetails with my very, very first master class about prime squares. Isn't this just a really, really pretty finish thanks to the threat of queen takes h7? And we get you from behind, either with this back rank mate or this back rank mate. After the move queen h3, black could not take the knight. Uh, Georgiou saw those variations, and he played the move h5. Once again, I would like to ask you to play like Grandmaster Larry Christensen. Or even perhaps you'll find something better than what Grandmaster Larry Christensen played. What would you do exactly here in this position if you had white pieces? I'm struggling. People are struggling with my questions, Amon. <laughs> and the fellow said, I'm struggling after 1e4. <laughs> 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 Shag. Yeah, just, being honest just being honest. Knight takes h5, jumps out immediately. Knight takes h5, very clear, very clear. Sack, of course, of course. It's so easy to sacrifice somebody else's pieces. But you're at the board. You have to, you have to imagine that these are your pieces. Knight takes h5, jumps to your mind, as well it should. And after g takes h5, uh, Queen takes h5 might, for example, come to your mind, or maybe knight takes h5 and a rook lift. Bring the rook looks really, really good. But is it really, really good? Should you sacrifice? Um, maybe you should just play a move, for example, like queen h4. That knight on f6, pretty good knight. You could set your opponent up for a cheap little uh, discovered uh, attack swindle with a move like queen h4. Maybe after queen h4 you could then make another slightly creepy crawly little move like queen g5. So you could play knight takes h5. So then I guess what I'm going to ask yourselves, be honest, don't, uh, uh, don't, um, Look at everybody else's homework. Would you sacrifice with knight h5, or would you not sacrifice with the move queen h4? I'm going to give you a minute, but if you already know your answer, by all means in the chat, uh, give me some feedback. Let me know. Let me know what you're thinking. 
So a lot of people initially were very gung-ho about sacrificing on knight h5. Now they're beginning to think that maybe, maybe queen h4 is not so bad. Okay, bestias. I never sacrifice because I can't calculate enough to verify if it's good. Not a bad idea there, uh, Dark Blader. Um, Michael Tall, uh, when he lost the World Championship title in 1961 in the rematch with Michael Bodvinnik, the um, journalist asked him, you know, about his defeat and what he thought about it. And he said that he was very, very happy because now all the Russian, the Soviet school children, uh, could learn how to protect their pawns and pieces instead of learning how to sacrifice <laughs> the pawns and pieces. So, knight takes h5, very tall light, queen h4, I don't know, it's a kind of a positional move. What do we got? What do we got? Queen h4, can't, can't tell enough. Queen h4, queen h4, then queen e Right, so, Thank you, Rook Crusher. You got it. So if you go queen h4, defending the knight, and black goes queen f, queen d6, pardon me, uh, uh, attacking the knight, knight takes, you're going to end up sacrificing the knight anyway. Okay? But as it turns out, Larry sacrificed the knight at once, and this was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you baited him. When you said knight h5, it's like, oh, I'm so good. good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a this is the wrong move. <laughs> Funnily enough, this is really amazing. It turns out that queen h4, queen d6, knight takes h5 was the right continuation because you got the black queen to commit itself to d6. We'll see in a moment why uh, that is the case. Larry took, captured, and then played rook to d3. Look at that rook up and over, and he's anticipating crashing down with rook g3 check, and queen takes h5, and glory days are here again until you see the move queen h8. Oh my goodness, that defends. So it defends the pawn on h5. After rook g3 check, the king could move back. Suddenly the queen defends a lot of business squares along the g-file. If the queen were on d6, and the queen was on h5, none of these defenses would have been possible for black, and queen h, the inclusion of queen h4 and queen d6 would be much better than the game. So, let's see how it goes. Rook check, king here, rook here. Okay. Now, what I would like you to do is after the move h4, oh, sorry, after the move h4, rook g4, now I want you to imagine that you're in black shoes. You see the consequence of rook h4 followed by rook h5, and you're hopelessly crushed. Should you resign? Should you play a move like bishop c8, hoping to take advantage of the skewer? Put yourself in black's shoes and tell me what move you would play as black. I'd resign. Good one, Dark Vader. Just uh, uh, showing understanding. 
Aha, bogus rogue says, hey, wait a minute. Isn't there a back rank threat? Yeah. Well, white bloom, uh, bishop c8 looks nice until you see rook takes h4, bishop takes h3, rook takes h8 check, and you lose a piece. <clears throat> Oops. And at the end, thank you, infernal kush. You have the f6 move that you just mentioned, but then the knight can come back to f3 and defend the rook. Honey baby says queen takes e5. Queen sacrifice. What? Ooh, bogus rogus. Rook takes e5. Take the knight. That's what I'm seeing. Congratulations to the chat. Rook takes e5, turns the tables completely around. Thanks to the back rank uh, mate threat. After d takes e5, queen takes e5, ruh row. Oh my word. Uh, black is uh, suddenly the one in the driver's seat here. And it's black who is winning. Now, after, for example, this is a bad move, uh, bishop c8 is a really terrific line for black. In any case, Florin had to play h4, and the game might have gone queen f3 and rook e6. Uh, queen f3 had ideas like this and like this. Rook h5 ideas. Queen f4, queen h6 is a typical variation that Larry Christensen gave in his notes to this game that appeared in Chess Life many, many years ago. And he said the game would have ended in a perpetual check if only Florin had played the move h4. Georgiou did not play the move h4. Georgiou played the move rook e6. Now it's white to play. Tell me what you would do if you were white. What would you do if you were white? Oh, sorry, white boom. How does bishop c8 lose a piece? Bishop c8, rook takes, attacking the queen. Bishop takes, rook takes, check. King g7, rook takes. Now, after move like f6, the knight can return. And even though you do have a little, little bit of play, it's a lot of pawns for white. This would be a winning line for white. Remember, white sacrificed the piece, so winning the bishop back is winning the piece back. So uh, rook e6 is where I left it. You now have to de decide, aha, uh -huh, queen takes e6, f takes e6, knight g6, forking the king and queen, White Broom, you're very, very welcome. So a lot of queen takes e6. Congratulations. You have played like Larry Christensen. And he took the rook and went into a much better ending. When you're playing isolated queen pawn positions again and again, most of the time you should really be seeking not end games, but middle games. Larry's move queen takes e6 is a good move. It wasn't the best. The best move in the position was actually rook takes h5. Why not take a pawn? After, for example, a move like queen f6, you play f4. You're going to play f5, rook here, f6, rook h8, mate. Power chess. For example, knight c4, f5. Knight takes e5, check. Only move king e7, takes. And you're completely winning. Black's king is blown into the center of the board, into the waiting arms of a rook. 
and uh, it's a completely winning and one position for Larry. There is nothing wrong with queen takes e6. Going into a better ending only that rook takes h5 was much more powerful. This is the ending, and Larry played h4. Push him, baby. Push him, baby. Um, two minor pieces for a rook and two pawns. White is definitely for choice, but this end game is not all uh, uh, easy. Fortunately for Larry, um, Georgiou, who was in time trouble, actually made a mistake with the move knight c6. He had to play the move bishop c8. Bishop c8, and for example, we'll just put a move on the board, say rook e3, let's say rook f7, and um, rook check, king up, rook here, and I was going to play bishop d7. The idea is that black absolutely, oops, excuse me, absolutely has to play against the rooks and keep the position um, closed. He played knight c6, Larry pounced, and his rooks now really dominate the game. The, the finish was actually rather picturesque. A mistake. How did Larry finish the game? <laughs> I see. Rook takes f5. Exactly. Exactly. Rook takes f5. Sack the rook. Hit the bishop on d7. And that's all it, it took. Is rook takes f5 and rook d7 check. Larry won the game. Clinched the grandmaster title. And... Uh, this game has been celebrated as a kind of a model victory for isolated queen pawn players. Again, uh, studying the pawn structures, learning the plans, the pawn skeletons. If you play a Sicilian, look at the pawn skeletons. If you play um, a Brayer variation of the Spanish, look at the pawn skeletons. If you play a Benoni, what are the ideas that come out of the pawn skeletons? And funnily enough, there are entire books written on, for example, the isolated queen pawn. Um, Alexander Baburin, I believe, wrote one such book, and I really found it to be a very enjoyable and book. I hope you've enjoyed this masterclass.